Hello and welcome to Thriving on a Carnivore Diet and let's talk supplements. So if you don't know, my name is Christina. I'm a naturopath, herbalist, life coach, as well as carnivore. And this is a space where I'm talking about all things carnivore and health related. So one of the questions that I get asked quite a lot is, do you need supplements on carnivore? What supplements do you need? Uh, but what about all of the different things like, you know, electrolytes, vitamin C, multivitamins, uh, minerals, all of the different things, right? What about all of that? Well, the answer to that question for me is a multifaceted one. And that is, it all depends on where you're starting from. Where you're starting from in regards to your health status before you actually start carnivore, um, what things you you actually are going through in, in regards to carnivore. Like there's a lot that goes on there. So for example, if you've got a chronic health condition, uh, the likelihood is that you probably are gonna need some stuff in the early days stages and days at least simply because you're probably very deficient in nutrients and you might be deficient in zinc you might be deficient in a whole bunch of different nutrients you might have um, things like candida overgrowths and all sorts of other stuff that you need some help with you might have heavy metal toxicity um, etc etc all of which you might need some actual help with in those early days. Now, you could potentially try and go without anything and actually see if it resolves. And the likelihood is that it probably will start to resolve a lot of those conditions. However, it might take a lot longer than if you use stuff to help you uh, boost up um, and to get some of those organs working properly. Now, I feel like the answer to this question is how long is a piece of string? But I want to pre-emphasize it with that as a practitioner, one of my own personal goals has always been to only prescribe what is necessary and to teach my clients how to use food. Now, I spent a long time learning how to use different plants, different vegetables, uh, different meats, different cooking methods, etc., to be able to help my clients get um, get what they needed out of the actual food that they were consuming um, versus the supplement pathway. So I was always a low prescriber when it came to prescribing uh, different types of supplements and so on. I was more inclined to prescribe a herbal formula uh, simply because there's multiple different things that I can put into that herbal formula versus you taking three, four, five, six. Sometimes I've seen clients come in and they're on 15 different supplements. Um, instead of that pathway, the pathway of putting it all into an actual herbal tonic that you take and then it's just like one or two, three things that you might need to take. That's always been my preferred pathway is to condense, uh, utilize lifestyle, utilize food as the first methods and then using those things like now plant medicines, our homeopathics and all of that sort of stuff, a supplemental medicine as secondary, secondary forms. And interestingly enough, I talk about this with my carnivore support group members that for me, when I went carnivore, one of the things that I found within my business was that I dramatically lost income. Now, not because of I saw less clients, but because I just went, here's the food that I think you should eat to try and get those nutrients in, and let's lower some of these other plant ones. Now, I'm a pick your own adventure girl. You can choose which way you want to go and I'm here to help support you in whichever direction you want to go in. Um, and you know, I understand that life is complex. It's not simple math. It's not a simple equation. It is a lot of moving parts. So for example, I've had clients that have come in and they're right in the middle of a divorce, for example. That's not the time for me to give them the hardest dietary protocol for them to follow. That might be the time where we use some supplemental medication to get them through that process and then as they come out the other side the fog is starting to clear then we start to increase the steps of dietary changes and lifestyle changes and reduce those supplemental changes now that has always been my approach of pick your own adventure i'm here to support you it's not me pushing something onto you it's me helping guide you through what you decide you want to actually do for yourself um, but you know, I'm going to tell you what I think is the best method and what's the, here's the options that are available to you. You choose which one's going to work for you. Because at the end of the day, I'm not going to be in your house cooking your steak and cooking your food. 
I'm not going to be there doing the shopping for you. I'm going to be the one on the cheer, on the on the sideline cheering you on and telling you you can go for it and helping you work through some of the mindset stuff that might come up if if we're in that space together, as well as directing and guiding what tweaking and changing might need to be made. But I'm not doing it for you. I can't do it for you. You have to do it for yourself. So therefore, you have to be a proactive participant in deciding what's actually going to be the most beneficial pathway for you. Now, with that being said because i was teaching a lot of less less supplements more food i decreased that that side that stream of income for me um, which meant that you know things that i would prescribe and again i was already a low prescriber so the things that i would prescribe would dramatically reduce because a lot of my clients went you know what this meat-based carnivore hyper carnivore keto stuff that kind of makes sense to me i'm going to give it a try and the more that we did that the more they didn't need supplements the more they didn't need these other things and so that just meant that there was a decrease in that pathway now i share this because you've got it my challenge as a practitioner has always been having a business and doing the best thing in terms of my clients. Now, for me, it's always been the the outcome of creating great results for my client has always been the overwhelming driver. But I can also see in my field that having a thriving business that has a great turnover is a driving factor for some people within that space. And it therefore, you know, there, there, wherever there's money involved, which is in every aspect of our life, there's always some complications in that. And I want people to understand that just like we might have conversations about pharmaceuticals and doc, the doctor relationship, we have the same thing in natural health as well. You know, if you want to be a registered practitioner where you're coming under a registered body or a registration type of, you know, you're an associate of a particular association, etc., then you need to do uh, what is known as CPE, which is continued practitioner education. And you know, you go along to particular things. Now there's certain, there's lots of different ways that you can get that practitioner education, get through mentoring, you can get it through uh, buying books and writing some notes on those books and reading them, etc. You can get it through uh, attending seminars and webinars and workshops and so on. And those webinars and workshops and programs like, you know, conferences, etc., are all generally sponsored by the pharmaceutical company. Now I say the pharmaceutical company because they are the ma major shareholder when it comes to supplementation now we don't think of supplements as pharmaceuticals but they are created by the same labs they just basically packaged with like cleaner greener names um, to not give that same sort of feeling that they've come from a pharmaceutical uh, this pharmaceutical industry but actually majority of them are still owned by a a branch of a pharmaceutical um, lab or manufacturer and so the same thing applies that they, they, they provide education and within that education they then uh, tell you how to use their product in order to create the results that you're wanting to try and get with your client now whenever there's that type of thing you have to ask how much of the information am i being given is accurate and true and how much of it is geared towards getting me to sell this particular type of supplementation to somebody um, and a lot of it is geared at maintenance versus like we're fixing the actual underlying problem and that has always been a challenge for me as a practitioner i used to go along to those things and go all right okay the etymology of the particular illness that we're talking about here i'm taking away little bits of information new research understanding etc etc but I'm always going with a really cynical mind about you know, what products we might need to use, even when it comes to the different names of the probiotics, et cetera, that we need to use for, for those things because I haven't necessarily seen amazing, extraordinary outcomes in patients that have gone down that pathway of like single use probiotics for you know, a variety of different things. There are very specific situations where that might be useful, but um, unfortunately what I generally see is that it, there's this overuse of, you know, say a single strand probiotic when we are 
designed to have loads of different bacteria thriving so that we can actually thrive along with those. Uh, and so side note here, some of the most powerful probiotics that are on the face of the earth are actually carnivore ones. So milk kefir, for example, is one of the most powerful probiotics there is on the face of the earth and we cannot put it in a supplement. We can't actually dehydrate it and keep it alive so that when it's in your body it comes back to life. We can't do that, it actually dies within that processing because it's quite, quite um, fragile. And so the processing of it from a laboratory perspective doesn't doesn't keep it alive. And so we, we actually just can't even make some of the stuff that you could make at home like milk kefir, which is one of the most powerful probiotics on the face of the planet. Um, and has some of the most incredible beneficial um, impacts on health and gut and healing that there actually ever is. Um, Again, you can make that in your own kitchen, which is for me, like my ultimate goal is for people to understand how much power they actually have in their own kitchen with their food that they can make at home uh, and so on. And so when it comes to me shifting to carnivore, there was, I was already a low prescriber and I became an even lower prescriber because I just saw that as we start to get the food right, the need for things like supplementation is dramatically less. Now, one of the questions that I get asked about is what about vitamin C? Uh, because we are generally taught that vitamin C comes like from fresh fruit and vegetables. Well, that is true. There is vitamin C in fresh fruit and vegetables. The other thing that's also in fresh fruit and vegetables is generally some fructose or some glucose. Now, fructose and glucose compete with vitamin C receptors for, well, there, there's receptors that are there that can either fit glucose, fructose, or vitamin C in them. And so when you've got both of those together, they actually compete. And so if you've got a high glucose diet or a high fructose diet, you have to have a high vitamin C diet so that you are balancing uh, that competition out. Whereas you take away the carbohydrates and the glucose and the fructose, you don't have to compete for vitamin C. The vitamin C space and the receptors for vitamin C are actually available and open for vitamin C to go into. So the more like what you're actually eating is then available to go into these receptors. And so from that perspective, all meat contains vitamin C. Now liver generally has a bit more vitamin C than any other of the muscle meats, but all of your muscle meats contain vitamin C and you don't have that competition with the glucose for the receptors. And so therefore your need for something like that is greatly actually reduced. Uh, and so therefore dietary wise, you can generally get enough of that in dietary wise um, with, with eating good quality protein. Now, from the perspective of things like multivitamins and minerals and so on, when it comes to a multivitamin, my question always is, why do you need the thing? Like, what do you need from that, that multivitamin that you're not getting from your food? Now, there could be a multiple multiple reasons, one of which is you've been significantly deficient for a long period of time, in which case a multivitamin in the beginning may be helpful in just helping you to build up your stores. Um, the other thing too is that you may have some digestive weakness. So you might have some issues with your, your gut acid where your stomach acid is too low because of things like Helicobacter pylori, which is a yeast that lives in the digestive system and shuts down the acids. So some signs that you might have that is a, is a really white coating on your tongue, which is candida, which is a yeast that's thriving. And then at the back of that tongue, if that's a little bit yellow, that's often a sign of Helicobacter pylori. You might also have things like um, frequent hiccups you might have um, reflux where you've got acid coming back up your throat. You might have heartburn. Um, you might just have overall lowered absorption of, of nutrients. Uh, and that would suggest to me that maybe you need to take a multivitamin or I'm probably actually going to lean towards helping you digest your food even better, which would be cooking it slowly so it's in a slow cooker type of situation where it's already falling apart. Um, utilizing things like white flaky fish, that can be a beautiful way to actually help a digestive system that's struggling. Um, lots of meat broth, for example, is another really great way for a digestive system that's struggling and then lifting the acid. So lemon juice in water, apple cider vinegar in water can be two really great ways to lift that acid and help you break down the food that you're actually eating and get more out of it. Now that's generally the way that I'm more likely to go than the multivitamin way. Now, part of the reason that I'm more likely to go that way is even though apple cider vinegar would be counted as like 
somebody would count that as a plant uh, same as lemon juice in water that would be counted as a plant I think of them as herbals and I think about them for a specific use like it's not a food for nutrition it's a food for supporting the digestive system in this weakened state and so therefore you know for me I see it as a completely different different thing now, when it comes to that, I would much prefer to go with a food over a supplement, even if that food is not like what other people would consider carnivore. Uh, I'd much rather go with that food because I'm kind of more in the space of like, I think most people could probably be hyper carnivore keto or ketovore, right? I think most people could be that if they're healthy and well. Um, but not everybody is healthy and well and actually a lot of people have got chronic health issues and they've got things like autoimmune conditions, which puts them in the not healthy and well category. Uh, and so some of these, for me, some of the plant medicine, I'd much rather do a plant medicine than I would take a supplement. Now, part of the reason is that our supplements all generally have fillers. So those fillers are designed to keep whatever you put in the thing dry, um, stop it from spoiling, give it shelf stability, all of that type of stuff. Some of those fillers can be things like sawdust. Some of those fillers can be things like our clothes. So once our clothes, we've finished using them, we might take them to the op shop. Uh, depending on the op shop, if they're too ratty to be used there, they may send them on to another um, place and that place might actually buy them, bleach them, dry them, turn them into powdered form, and then put them in our supplements or sell them to the pharmaceutical industry as supplemental fillers called microcellulose. Uh, and so there's always generally something in that. So it might even be rice flour. It could be, um, there's a whole heap of fillers. There's some, some corn based ones. There's a whole heap of them. Uh, and so there's a filler generally in the supplementation and the number of times I've had a client who has tried a supplement that should be fine, right? It's the exact thing that they, they need for their condition, but it has got a filler in it that wasn't necessarily clearly advertised that was a problem to them. So they might have celiacs, for example, and the filler that's in their supplement was actually derived from wheat. Uh, and then that creates a problem for them. So for me, I'd much rather go down a food-based medicine pathway than I would a supplementation pet medicine pathway. And that's always the, the thinking that I tend to go with when I'm working with clients is, is there a food that I could get them to eat that's going to help them with this versus a supplement? Now, that's the general case, but every case is different and every individual person is different because everybody's health situation is different and their life is different. So everyone is unique and therefore needs something slightly different based on their unique circumstances at that moment in time. And so from that perspective, I'm, I won't say no supplements whatsoever, ever, ever, never, because that's not actually the truth. The truth for me is the, more, the least amount of supplements as possible. Now, I will also still use herbal medicine. Uh, and again, I'm much happier with herbal medicine, especially too, because the way that I generally prescribe is, is of a more homeo, homeopathic level um, and or a lower dose. So generally, again, when I'm, I'm writing my herbal formulas, I'm writing them often at a much lower dose than what other people are. And I'm prescribing them at a daily dose much lower than what other people are as well. Because if we get the diet right, we actually don't need as much because dose is important. Um, and getting the right dose for the right person is important as well. So we might do drop, drop dosing, we might do um, mill dosing, and we might then go to a larger dose if we need to, depending on the individual and the situation that they're actually in and the circumstances that they have around their health. And so it's always very unique. And my method and my thought process is not forever. There are only a few situations where it's forever and that's where people have had organs that have been removed. So for example, they've had their thyroid damaged or removed, um, radiated or removed, uh, where they've you know lost a particular organ that no longer is available to them, um, then I'm gonna be leaning more towards a supplementation. So for example, if you've had your tonsils removed, then I'm gonna recommend that you have something like liposomal vitamin C in your cupboard at home. Um, I think everybody should have that at home just for those moments when you are sick, but more importantly if you've had something like your tonsils removed because your tonsils are your front rudders for your immune system they take a sample of everything that comes in so they sample the air they sample the the food and the drink that you're actually taking and when they're taking that sample 
what they do is they send that information down into the immune system and the immune system creates antigens based on that and it starts that battle round of defending you uh, and so it's a, it's a really important aspect and so when we don't have that I do generally recommend that you have liposomal vitamin C at home so that you're ready to go at the first moment of illness. Now with that said I'm also going to recommend that the moment you get the sore throat and you think you might be getting something, buy some liver, cook it up and eat it until it tastes metallic. Once, it hit, once you hit that spot where it's tasting metallic, you know you've really built up your vitamin C levels at that point. You've got the nutrients that you need from it and you're good to go. For me, I haven't had a cold really in the last, um, I will say probably eight months because I had a few when I first um, left Tasmania. And after that i have not been sick and like right now my family have got it got an illness because they're not 100 percent carnivore uh they've got a cough and a cold some of them have got even the vomits uh i have not got any of those things um and it's not through their lack of trying because my daughter keeps drinking out of my drink bottle and she has been vomiting <laughs> uh, and i am not vomiting so you know my immune system is actually vastly improved by taking out all of the other stuff the plants and the the other toxins that come with those um and so the answer to the question is always how long is a piece of string it has to be independent in the sense of it has to be individual based on what's actually happening for that that person but things that i do think are generally important are minerals so um depending on where you're getting your animals from for example like i've got an amazing farmer down in tasmania who i would trust uh with with so much when it came to animal husbandry and the care of his animals and the quality of the animals that are coming off of that land because i know how much he invests in getting to know his soil and his land and actually cultivating all of that from an organic perspective um, and looking after those animals really well i I dare say that not all farmers are exactly the same as him and, and um, have that same knowledge as him and probably have other uh, restrictions as well, which might me then mean that they don't necessarily have the minerals that are there. They may be lacking in some things. Their soil might not be so great. Their feed might not be so great, um, which then will mean that the product of the animal that you're getting will have a decrease level of minerals available to you the other thing is that water is important so generally speaking if you've got a reverse osmosis water uh, filter for example that actually takes out everything like it is very good at cleaning the water it takes out everything and strips everything but water is not actually meant to be completely empty it's actually meant to have minerals in it and those minerals are actually vital for our body in trace amounts so one of the things that i see when i've got clients that have been using reverse osmosis filters is that they're what i would call the dehydrated hydrators in the sense that they are drinking water all the time but they've got symptoms of dehydration and so when i ask them have you got a reverse osmosis filter and they're like yeah I'm like, well, you need to be putting minerals back into your water. And that's where colloidal minerals can be handy. It's where taking some electrolytes can be handy. Um, and that is where adding some minerals back to your water can be really helpful in actually preventing things like tooth decay and some of the other important aspects because we all need trace minerals and that's also where really good quality salt comes in where you've got a variety of minerals within that salt now for me one of the things that i have is a big like pasta glass jar that whenever we are somewhere new i will usually buy like whatever salt is is there that's on special so for example we might have the murray river salt we might have uh, pink himalayan salt we might have celtic salt we might have a whole bunch of them and they all go into this jar and um, essentially throughout that jar of salt i've now got a beautiful range of different minerals because each one of those salts has got a slightly different mineral makeup and my job there is to expose my body to a range of minerals which then allows it to take what it needs and leave what it doesn't and so that's another way of like replenishing some of those minerals that we all often be losing because of things like our water filtration um, and you know it's it, this is always the challenge and the catch-22 of like if you're on town water for example here in Australia most most places not all but majority of places you are likely to be getting fluoride well you don't want that fluoride because that's going to be damaging to your thyroid and like 
it's a neurochemical and it's we don't want it in our brains and all of that type of stuff uh, and so then you need some sort of filtration process to get rid of that but if you're filtering it and not remineralizing it then you've also got another problem there and this is where the challenge often lies for for us with many of these things um, but for me overall when it comes to supplementation and carnivore past the first period like once you get to the place where your body is working functionally healthy and well you should then be able to start to remove and let go of most if not all of those external supplementations like vitamins and i'm not going to say minerals because we still need minerals but i think that we should be getting them from food-based ways like colloidal minerals and uh, good quality quality salt that's got minerals in it uh, and then we may occasionally need some things like um, some herbal remedies here and there to actually help us if we get you know an infection or we've we've got a cold or a flu or those types of things again I'm still going to go first to the food and then use some of those herbs from that perspective um, that I generally work in but I can say to you for this last year there's very few things that I personally have needed to take in order to reverse things like diabetes and now insulin resistance. Uh, and those things are electrolytes. I've certainly taken those and I don't take them all the time. I take them when I'm in places where I'm really hot or when my body's doing a lot of detoxification. And your body will go through cycles when it comes to detoxification because it doesn't want to live in detox land too long. It needs to go through detoxing and building and detoxing and building. And so, you know, I know when my body's starting to do those things and I'll generally add some electrolytes when that's actually happening. Um, so I might get some signs of like, oh, I've got a light headache or I'm just feeling extra thirsty or I'm noticing that I'm peeing more. Those are the times when I'm going to add some electrolytes to my water to increase my absorption and support my body as it moves through those phases of detoxification. Um, but also too, again it really depends on what age group you're in and how your life has been previously so for example generally if you're a woman that's that's either about to reach menopause or has gone through menopause i'm going to recommend that you're eating like small oily fish um, at least three times a week so that might be sardines yay <laughs> um, but it might be that you can tolerate like mackerel or um, you know anchovies or those types of just small fish that have got bones in them you can even get sardine you can even get salmon with bones in it and like mush that up so that you don't actually chomp on an actual bone um, that can give you some of the, the beneficial um, vitamin D that you're going to get through there but also some of the calcium um, that's going to support your bone density as you start to move through that age group as well. Uh, so there might be specific foods that I would recommend at different ages and stages in your healing journey as well as like life like for example men I'm generally going to recommend that you have some oysters because men lose a lot of zinc uh, through the process of creating babies let's put it that way um, they will lose a lot of zinc in that process and you know zinc deficiency is often the leading cause of the swollen prostate um, and so we've got to make sure that we replenish the things that we lose or use a lot so oysters are going to be one of the ways that I would recommend people do that um, yeah so that's that's the negotiation the other part of the negotiation often is what are will what are people willing to do because i just mentioned oyster oysters not everybody's willing to eat oysters a lot of people are like Egh! when it comes to oysters um and so in that in that way i'm gonna say okay this might be where taking a zinc supplement might be helpful for you for us to replenish what you're deficient in and then hopefully your food will be enough to carry you from there um, but if it's not, then um, we need to keep taking the supplement or we need to be open to trying some of these foods that are actually going to be uh, higher in zinc and more beneficial to us to support that particular area that we're particularly weak in. All right. I think that is it. That, that all I'm going to say. I could certainly go into much more detail, um, but this would be a three hour video instead of a 30 minute one so i'm going to leave it there and i'm going to leave you this final thought in that as a practitioner i can tell you that when i moved to carnivore for myself and started to lead a lot more of my clients in a meat-based diet um, i saw that my financial return on supplementation dramatically dropped 
simply because I didn't need to write as many scripts for people and that people were far more willing to look at food first than they were to go down the supplemental pathway. And that's how I'd much rather my clients actually spend their money. Because remember, there's a lot of money and a lot of marketing created to develop new science, which is generally not that new, and develop products that are specifically targeted for specific things that, aren't, that are, could be found in other stuff that you could be eating and that would give you a much more rounded complexity of nutrients versus that one singular nutrient that is being researched. So just keep that in mind when you're thinking about supplements versus food, that often you'll find the thing that you want is actually already in a food. You just need to work out what to eat it, like what to eat for you and how to eat it and maybe how much to eat it to actually get those benefits. And then maybe you might need a supplement to pick you up because you're dramatically sick or drastically sick. And after a short period of time, you shouldn't need it forever unless you've got things like organs missing, being in a car accident, those types of things. There's always an exception, um, but the generalization is you should be working to be able to get off of those things. All right, that is it for me. I hope you have the most amazing day ever and I'll talk to you again soon. See you later. Bye for now. Leave me any more questions below. I would love to answer them and remember to like and subscribe. It really helps me out. Bye for now. See you later.